This video is sponsored by Aura. Having been tasked with the impossible challenge of coming after Square's magnum opus, this game was still able to carve its way into the fandom, with what many consider to be the single best love story in the franchise. Although the junction system was a hit or miss for players, the game's style, characters, and themes were more than enough to warrant a spot in many players' top games of all time. This is the ultimate Final Fantasy VIII Iceberg. Scaling Enemies One of the more notorious aspects of this game is the fact that the enemy levels will scale based on your average party's level, give or take 20%. This was unlike many other RPGs at the time, which allowed your characters to level independent of enemy levels. The standard model would allow the player to grind battles to over-level their characters, essentially making challenging bosses or situations easier, sometimes making the battles completely trivial. But in Final Fantasy VIII, enemy levels would increase right along with your characters. This enemy scaling system was created as a way to combat this over-leveling strategy, providing additional challenge. Players would soon discover that intentionally keeping your party's average level lower, while capitalizing on the game's refining and junction systems, allowed players to absolutely trivialize a good majority of the game's battles. Thriller Dance Many players noticed even on their first playthrough, this notorious FMV early on in the game that heavily referenced the dance used in the music video for Michael Jackson's hit song, Thriller. Realistic Characters FF8 was the first game in the series to feature realistically proportioned characters. This means that the characters in the game were designed to look more like real people rather than the exaggerated or stylized designs of previous games in the series. This change was implemented in order to make the characters more relatable and to create a more realistic and immersive world. As a result, the characters in FF8 are more detailed, with more defined muscles and facial features, and having more lifelike animations and movements. The design choice was implemented by Tetsuya Nomura, the game's character designer, and it was received very well by the fans. Eyes on Me While this wasn't the first musical piece in the series with lyrics, as FF6 featured a song sung in Italian, played during the opera scene, and 7, of course, featured One Winged Angel, an iconic song with Latin lyrics. But FF8's Eyes on Me was the first song with vocals that was featured prominently within the game. It was written and performed by Chinese singer Fei Wong. This song was included in the game's soundtrack, and it was used in the game's ending credits. The song became a hit in Japan and Asia, and it was well received by the fans as well as the critics. The song is a pop ballad with lyrics that reflect on the themes of love, relationships, and memories. It was written specifically for the game, and its melody and lyrics were carefully chosen to reflect the game's story. The song was also released as a single, and it was commercially successful. It was the first game's theme song to win an award, and it reached the top of the charts in Hong Kong, Taiwan, and Japan. Fei Wong's performance of the song was praised for its emotion and power, and her voice was considered to be a perfect fit for the game's theme. The song is still remembered by the fans as one of the most iconic and memorable songs in the Final Fantasy series, and it is often considered one of the best game's theme songs of all time. The Origins of Seed The origins of Seed within this game are quite convoluted, and the entire game is essentially a time loop, which is evident due to many reasons. First of all, Adea knew that Squall was going to defeat a sorceress one day, and it wasn't just a random belief. This happened as one day, a man told Adea that a sorceress would threaten the fabric of reality, and that she had to be stopped. He told her that she and her husband needed to create a place called the Garden, 
and the sole purpose of this place should be to train students from their youth and into their adulthood to defeat the sorceress. Edea recognizes this man as one of the children in her care, who is none other than Squall, and knew that things would lead to this day eventually. She did what was instructed, and Squall would eventually grow up. He is then specifically assigned to the mission of destroying the sorceress, and the length of the game plays out exactly as we know with Squall and his party's journey. Eventually, when reality is being distorted during the pursuit of Ultimisha, who is the sorceress that they were all warned about, time compression sends Squall straight into the past by a mistake. There, he finds a younger Adia, and he urges her to take precautions about the threat of the future, which brings us back to the beginning of the time loop. In this full circle, Squall himself causes a younger self to be trained, and each time this loop plays out, he will once again do the same thing, until the sorceress is defeated in different timelines. One-Shot Omega Weapon If you manipulate things in a specific order, by the time you get to fight the Omega Weapon, Selfie's final limit break, known as The End, can instantly defeat this powerful boss. Even if you use this as the first move in the fight, Selfie one-shots the giant boss straight away. Though this is most commonly used in the original PlayStation version of the game, some fans have proven that it works on the PC port as well. According to viewers, the end limit break can be cheesed on the PS1 by opening the lid of the console. As the character and enemy ATB stalls from being unable to read the data, which allows the player to scroll in the game at their leisure to find the end from the random list and use it easily. Do make sure to close the lid once the spell is cast, though. And this also works on the final boss as well, if you use it at any point before Ultimisha's final form. Once hit, you will see her continuously change forms before dying. The Great Hein This is a character mentioned in Final Fantasy VIII. He is attributed with creating people and being the first sorceress in the game's lore. Despite his assumed power, it is up to debate whether he is divinity or just a person. As a mark of respect, a sorceress can be referred to as a Heinz descendant, due to how big his legend is. The entire tradition of the sorceresses started due to the legends circulating about Hein, and they have been passed on towards generations onto the witches of the world. There are two instances in the game where we are told a story about Hein. It's also worth mentioning that the story of Hein casting off his skin is most likely a reference to another character named Hein from Final Fantasy III. This is a skeleton who happens to be a magician, and both these Hein and Hein characters are spelled the same in Japanese. Some fans use this as evidence to connect both games to the same continuity, though it's not a theory that is widely accepted. And one last thing to note is that Hein is mentioned as both a he and she throughout different translations and characters in FF8, so it's hard to decide which one is the accurate pronoun. However, it could be fair to assume that perhaps the character might be androgynous. Leviathan Exploit Leviathan in Final Fantasy VIII has a unique glitch which instantly defeats the enemy. Whenever Leviathan hits a target, it is pushed backwards. This is a display indicator for a hidden state called washing away. If you can summon Leviathan before the target has taken its turn, the target is defeated instantly. This works on almost everything in the game, which even includes bosses, which makes it an amazing exploit that is used both for speedrunning and by players who want to save time. An Interpretation of Squall and Cypher's Scars there exists a beautiful interpretation behind the scars that these characters received in the fight, especially in terms of what it means for the story and its themes. Cypher and Squall have the same type of weapon, yet they have different meanings behind their use. Cypher strikes downwards from a position of power after having used magic to beat him. Squall possessed two summons, but did not have them with him. As you can see from them being in his terminal at the beginning of the game, after being rushed into the infirmary. 
so he most likely couldn't use his magic, and the opponent abusing this could be considered unsportsmanlike for practice duels. Thus, Cypher's cut could have been seen as cruel and unnecessary, born out of a need to dominate. On the other hand, Squall's cut came from below and struck upwards, which is against the force of gravity, and showed us that Squall is more powerful as a swordsman and always gets back up to continue the fight. Cypher going down is symbolic to him falling from grace, as he becomes the brainwashed lackey of the big bad, while Squall rises to glory. When you take the game's story in account, especially where these characters eventually end up, this indeed feels like symbolism subtly placed inside what we otherwise see as an intense duel. Cypher uses an older model of the Gunblade, the Hyperion model, which is lighter and easier to use, while Squall has a newer model, the Revolver, which is believed to require more skill to use than the average Gunblade, and this is further emphasized with their blade-wielding styles. Squall wields his weapon with both hands, while Cypher uses his weapon single-handedly. The Squall is Dead Theory One of the most popular fan theories regarding FF8 is that Squall is actually dead. The theory points out that certain situations that occur after he is struck by the Ice Spear are very unrealistic, so the rest of the game might just be a dream of his. However, many fans have pointed out that it's very unlikely that Squall is dead, and that the game is full of unrealistic things before that point too, as it's a fantasy game after all. Fortunately, the debate was officially buried once Yashinori Katasi officially revealed in an interview that this was not true. He revealed that Squall did not die in the game, and that he was stabbed around the shoulder area, However, he did state that he found the idea interesting, and might toy with it if Final Fantasy VIII is ever remade. Renoa is Ultimisha Theory Similar to the Squall is Dead theory, another theory that you very often see in the FF8 fanbase is that Renoa is in fact Ultimisha. The reason behind this is that there are several similarities between the two characters, as they are both witches, and their appearance is quite similar as well, especially in certain FMV sequences. In some cases, slapping on Altamisha's tattoos on Renoa's face almost looks like the same person. However, the fans who disagree with this theory point out that Square Enix used to make similar character models in FMVs to save time, and that's why they appear this way. And eventually, the theory was shot down entirely once Yashinori Katasi officially revealed in an interview that it was not true at all. He said that Renoa is not Ultimisha, and he doesn't think he'd ever incorporate that idea even in a remake of the game. But he admits that he can see the similarities that fans point out because they are both witches, but reassured that the two are not the same person. Interestingly, unlike the Squall is Dead theory, which a majority of the fans seem to have accepted as false, many still claim that Renoa is Ultimisha against Katasi's statements. In particular, there is a very long Japanese video that details many similarities and time loops which hint on them being the same person, which includes a particular finger point that both Renoa and Ultimisha do. It also pointed out that the FF8 logo may have even included a hint to this connection. Examining the logo, particularly Renoa's fingers over Squall's shoulder, it almost seems to be claw-like, similar to Ultimisha's fingers. Though this is most likely due to fingers being notoriously difficult to draw. At the end of the day, well-written stories are open to interpretation, so it's very much fair for people to have their own opinions and people are allowed to have their own headcanon. The Queen of Cards Let's talk about some of the best side quests in the game. There is a side quest in the game called The Queen of Cards, which can be entered the first time you enter Balam. This quest allows you to get some very good cards in the game, such as the Doom Train and Chubby Chocobo cards. Every time you beat her, she shows up in a different location and lets you know she would be there. And funnily enough, even if you lose your cards, you can get them back by challenging her soon afterwards. 
As an avid internet researcher, I've found that anyone can find just about anything on the internet, including your full legal name, personal email, home address, phone number, and even your relatives. It can be as simple as a quick Google search to yield all of this personal information and more. It can be shocking to see your own mother's complete address for anyone with an internet connection to view. This information is accessible because of data brokers who profit by selling your information to robocallers, telemarketers, spammers, and anyone else that wants to learn more about you. And that's why I'm excited to tell you about today's video sponsor, Aura. Aura will identify data brokers that are exposing your information and automatically submit opt-out requests on your behalf. They'll even opt you out of junk mail and telemarketing lists. You can use my link, aura.com maker, to try two weeks for free to see how many data brokers are sharing your information. The link is also in the video description, or you can scan the QR code. Aura also monitors your emails and passwords to see if they were involved in a data breach or perhaps exposed on the dark web. Aura's app also features a VPN, password manager, real-time credit and identity theft monitoring, and it also protects your device from malware. Aura has almost every internet safety tool you'll ever need all inside one app. Let Aura do the hard work of keeping you safe online. You'll be shocked at how much of your private information Aura finds exposed over these two weeks. Again, go to Aura.com maker to start your free trial today. And now, back to the video. Squall's Different Personality Squall's personality is a bit different in the Japanese and English versions of the game. The difference is not that massive, but the key difference can be narrowed down to the fact that in the Japanese version, he's a bit more direct, while the English version has a more broody vibe to him. Hilariously, this is most evident in the game's iconic whatever catchphrase, which has been a subject of jokes within the fanbase for a long time. There are a total of 15 or more instances of the character saying whatever in the English version of the game, but in the Japanese version, these lines are different. For example, in one scene, Squall's teacher makes an inappropriate joke to which he says, whatever. In the Japanese version, however, he says, I can't believe this teacher, to point out that it's odd for a teacher to be acting this way. In a different scene, Renoa scolds Squall for not being a team player. In English, Squall says his patented whatever but in Japanese, he says something that sounds more similar to Man, you're annoying, or get off my case. Later on, there is a short conversation between Renoa and Squall in which she tries to get him to open up, to which Squall says something similar to just leave me alone. And obviously, the English version says whatever. There are several other scenes where the Japanese version had a different response, and one thing to note in particular is that even when he is meant to say whatever in Japanese as well, it sounds more like a sarcastic, well, excuse me, and sometimes a plain sorry. The dialogues slightly change based on who is translating them, as different people read into context differently, but they all come to the same conclusion and find different results compared to the simple whatevers. Yokai Watch Wibble Wobble Final Fantasy characters showing up in various RPG games as a crossover event is nothing unheard of, but sometimes it gets a little too obscure. Some of you might be familiar with Yokai Watch, which was once a very popular franchise similar to Pokemon that consisted of games, cartoons, and real-life merchandise. For some reason, a mobile puzzle game spin-off called Yokai Watch Wibble Wobble includes Squall as a playable character as part of the Final Fantasy collaboration. As unexpected as it might be, the game was well received by critics, but unfortunately, the English version of the game is no longer playable as it shut down in 2018. Angelo Search Exploit If you have Renoa in your party, you can use her dog Angelo to take advantage of an exploit that allows the player to farm a ridiculously large number of items with little to no trouble. 
The first thing to note here is that you need to teach Angelo the search skill and take it to a high level. You shouldn't teach Angelo other skills as they might interfere with this exploit. Every time you give Angelo this skill, run around a safe area or with encounter none or go to farm Cactuarge because she learns the skill as you take steps. Then you must ensure that you don't acquire Odin in the game because that can lead to acquiring Gilgamesh and he also interferes with Angelo's search by randomly popping up during battle. If you already have acquired Odin, then avoid getting Gilgamesh. The last step is to ensure that you have some stocks of Confuse as well. Once all of this is done, you must find a good target like a Turtopod, then confuse them and leave the game on for as long as you can. Angelo will search items. From here, you can acquire as much loot as you would desire. Interestingly, if you have the Steam version of FF8, then Chocobo World is considered a much faster way of earning these items than the Angelo grind. Limit Spamming This was another technique that players were able to take advantage of, specifically those who wish to run the game as fast as possible. By intentionally keeping your character's remaining health at a low percent with yellow text, players could trigger the ability to use the character's limit breaks. Combining this with lower player and enemy levels, it would allow players to abuse the limit break system repeatedly for remarkably quick battles instead of the limit break system in the prior game, which was only able to be used occasionally after the meter had built up. Or even worse, in FF9, where limit breaks would often go completely to waste during inopportune battles. Laguna's Roll If you pay attention to Laguna's roll within the game and connect all the dots to the context that is provided to the player, it becomes evident that Laguna both created all the problems in the game and in a way solved them as well. As explained in detail, our journey into understanding this game starts when the main characters are on their way to the Galbadia occupied timber to help the owls which is an anti-Galbadia resistance faction which Renoa belongs to at the start of the game. This travel is interrupted by a dream that shows us the past, in which Laguna is one of the Galbadian soldiers who takes part in the Siege of Timber. Laguna bails from his post to go to Dealing City and see Julia Hartilli, who is the piano player turned singer who wrote the Eyes on Me song. Laguna and Julia fall for each other, but Laguna is ordered to return to his post. After Laguna barely escapes an ambush by Esthar soldiers and goes missing in action, Julia thinks he died in battle and marries the Galbadian general Carraway, who is Renoa's father. Laguna winds up in Windhill, meets Rain, and marries her instead. When Rain's daughter, alone, is kidnapped by Esthar soldiers, Laguna leaves town and is unaware that Rain is pregnant. Eventually, Laguna tries to get into the hedgehog state of Esthar by any means necessary, and he starts to work for the Timber Maniacs, which is the revolutionary anti Galbadia magazine that inspires the Timber Owls, and by extension, the Owls inspire Renoa. And then, Renoa is associated by Squall, and the whole thing comes full circle. When you see everything put together, Laguna played a pivotal role in the cause of Timber's problems, and then the solution to them as well. It can be amazing to see how in-depth the story of FF8 is, with all its symbolism and details that make everything come together. Especially when you think about the fact that Laguna and Julia could never be together, yet so many years later, their children found each other, and their love succeeded in a different generation. The FF8 Murderer No FF game is complete without a real-world controversy surrounding it, like the FF7 house that we've covered in the retrospective iceberg for that game. In FF8, we have the Katana Killer, who was a teenager from Spain, called Jose Rabadan. He took both of his parents' and his sister's lives with a katana in the year 2000 and was immediately arrested afterwards. Though within Spain, he was just known as the killer with a katana, but this piece of news was used very differently in the rest of the world. 
The media didn't want to waste a second and rushed into conclusions that this real-life murder was inspired by FF8 because he was, quote, addicted to the game, and that he was, quote, imitating his hero Squall, as he thinks he had to take someone close to him within the game who happened to be Renoa. What they didn't know at the time is that despite the fact that he styled his hair like Squall and tried to imitate him in other ways, Jose had not even finished the game and hadn't even gotten to the part of the game where that event occurs. Thus, the entire speculation about him trying to be like Squall was proven false, and this just ended up being a usual case of fear-mongering for certain publications that used to try to prove that video games are evil. Eventually, the teenager was sentenced to eight years in jail, and he has since been given the nickname of the Katana Killer. Squall's True Design Inspiration Japanese rock artist and actor Gakt Kumui is known within the Final Fantasy community for his songs Redemption and Longing, which are the theme songs of Dirge of Cerberus. He is also the voice actor of Genesis Rhapsodos in Crisis Core, and played this role in live action format in front of a green screen for Dirge of Cerberus. And the appearance of Genesis in Crisis Core is also based on Gakt as well, which is easy to see. However, Gakt claimed on a television program that Squall from FF8 is modeled after him and referred to him as Gakt Number 2, but Tetsuya Namira himself contradicted this, saying that he based a lot of Squall's appearance on the late actor River Phoenix. Thus, whether what Gakt said is true or not, more inspiration was taken from River than him. Another interesting thing to note is that many popular images of River have him in longer hair, which could explain why Squall's hair is longer in Kingdom Hearts as well. Metaphor for the grieving process In another fan theory, it suggested that the game's story is actually a metaphor for the grieving process. According to this theory, Squall's character is seen as going through the five stages of grief, which are denial, anger, bargaining, depression, and acceptance. The theory proposes that Squall's initial denial of his feelings and avoidance of his past represents the first stage of denial. His anger and frustration with his circumstances and the people around him represent the second stage of anger. His attempts to change his fate and make a deal with fate could be seen as bargaining. His depression and feeling of isolation could be seen as the depression stage. And finally, his acceptance of his past and his role in the world could be seen as the final stage of acceptance. This theory suggests that the game's story is not only about a war between nations, but also an inner journey of self-discovery, healing, and acceptance. Zell's Love Interest During Zell's love quest, a secret meter is present in order to obtain additional moves for his limit break. To fill this meter, players must collect various issues of Combat King magazine. While most of the magazines can easily be obtained throughout the game, some players choose to buy them at the Esthar bookstore. However, for some players who want a more adventurous approach, Obtaining Combat King Issue 3 involves undertaking a quest that revolves around Zell's budding relationship with a secret admirer known as Library Girl with Pigtails. The interesting thing about this quest is that the amount of dialogue received at the end is based on this secret meter, which measures how interested players are in the two characters getting together. To achieve the best result, the players must visit the library eight specific times throughout the game, with the first visit taking place at the start of the game, and the final visit taking place after the Battle of the Gardens. Additionally, players must have visited the library over 50 times before the quest ends to show how much they care. This will result in a score of 5 out of 5, and the cutscene between Zell and the library girl with pigtails at the Balam Hotel will have no missing dialogue. The Real Renoa It's been said that this character was inspired by someone that Namira actually personally knew. While there aren't any hard confirmations of this, the rumor states that Namira was inspired by a female co-worker 
who conveniently enough had a dog that would also go on to serve as Renoa's dog Angelo's inspiration. This had been found on several fan sites throughout the years, and it is also said to be the primary reason as to why Renoa starts with about 10% higher base stats than any other playable character, and this gap increases to around 20% by level 100. World Map Globe Resemblance the game's world map is designed to resemble a globe, with different locations being placed in roughly the same positions as they would be on the Earth. This means that the game's world map is not a traditional top-down view, but instead it is represented as a three-dimensional globe. This allows players to get a sense of the game's world as a whole, and to see how the different locations are related to each other in terms of geography. This feature adds an extra layer of realism and immersion to the game's world, as it makes the world more believable, and it makes it easier for the player to understand. This design choice was made to enhance the player's experiences, and it was well received by the fans and the critics. The game's 3D representation of the world map is considered as one of the game's unique features, and it helped to set the game apart from other games in the series. The Pocket Station FF8 is one of the few games to contain Pocket Station features. If you owned one, you could download a mini RPG called Chocobo World to the Pocket Station device, and this allowed players to collect items and power up certain Guardian forces. Although the game was localized, the Pocket Station itself was not released outside of Japan, so the mini game became inaccessible to most people who could not import a Pocket Station. Oddly, the American release of the game does come with an entire section on Chocobo World inside the manual, but the text begins with a note that Chocobo World requires the Pocket Station personal game unit and that it may not be available outside of Japan. Fortunately, both the Steam re-release of the game and the 2013 re-release of the 2000 PC version include this feature. Regional Gameplay Changes FF8 has a few differences between the different versions of the game. In the Japanese version, the player has to defeat Ifrit and return to the entrance before time runs out at the Fire Cavern. However, in the English versions, the player just needs to defeat Ifrit to stop the timer. Some GFs can be re-obtained in Ultimisha Castle if the player missed an item, but this is not possible in the Japanese version. Between different versions, Torama, Iron Giant, El Noyal and Behemoth have different HP formulas as well. In the original Japanese version, the boss Zero Zero's organs were red, but it was changed to blue for the localized versions to make them feel less realistic. The Ultimisha's Castle Armory has red blood on the wall in the Japanese version, but the localized versions made them green. And lastly, Selfie's Nanchaku and any references to it were renamed to Shinobu in the European versions due to their laws at the time. Any references to ninjas and their weaponry were banned. And this is why the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles were the Teenage Mutant Hero Turtles. And Shinobu means Master Priest according to translations. Zell equals Tifa. Zell is one of the most commonly used party members in FF8, and he happens to be an incredibly strong character as well. Interestingly, he has several moves that are reminiscent of Tifa's limit breaks from FF7. These moves include Dolphin Blow, Punch Rush, Meteor Strike, and My Final Heaven. Save the Queen This is Quistus's most powerful whip, the weapon is mentioned in the August issue of the Weapons Monthly magazine and is stated to be the most powerful whip in the world. Interestingly, this phrase is a reference to God Save the Queen, which is a common phrase in England. Unfortunately, some European countries renamed the whip to Gold Snake, which makes sense since countries are more familiar with its connection to England. FF8 is not the only game with this reference, as FF3, 6, 9, 10, and many more mainline and spin-off games include this phrase in some form. Interestingly, Squall's ultimate weapon, Lionheart, 
is also an allusion to the moniker of a celebrated king of England, Richard I, who was known for his bravery and conquest during the Third Crusade. Air guys. This is Zell's ultimate weapon. What's interesting about this weapon is that its name comes from a German word that means ambition. And it's also the name of another Square Enix game as well that came out a year before Final Fantasy VIII and included some FF7 characters such as Cloud Strife and Tifa Lockhart. This tradition continued and some spin-off games in the future would include a weapon called Air Guys. Squall's Threat to Renoa In a scene where Renoa takes Squall to a concert and tries to get him to open up, she ends up making fun of his habit to place his hand towards his face whenever he is thinking. Once Squall notices that, he raises his hand in an intimidating manner, which many fans have interpreted as Squall threatening her. This is further supported by the fact that she immediately rolls backwards as if in defense. Then she gets up, laughs, and says sorry. However, just moments after, she pushes him down from where he is sitting, which is something that people seem to ignore. Thus, it's not actual violence, and they are just playful with each other, since Renoa is free to push him around as well. Anyway, the scene ends with Renoa telling Squall that his friends just want him to trust them, and open up a little bit more. Unfortunately, he just talks to himself about his reason for not opening up instead of just telling her the truth. Mirrors When examining the character of Cypher, you'll notice that almost everything about him mirrors Squall. His scar, his player card, his weapon, his victory poses, and even the fact that he used to date Renoa before she falls in love with Squall. Ultimately, one of them rises and the other one falls from grace. Memory Loss Using a GF in the game causes memory loss, because every time you junction one of them, it resides specifically in the part of your brain that contains long-term memory. And this is why characters don't seem to remember growing up with each other properly. This is why Irving's memory is intact because he didn't rely on using GFs before joining your team. And when Cypher leaves the garden, he stops using the GF, and thus when you fight him for the second to last time, he remembers everything about their childhoods together. This is because he had to rely on Chi-based attacks once he was kicked out of the garden. The Famous Anagram Vithos Lusek Vikos Vinosek is part of the lyrics for Liberi Fatali, which is the opening theme of Final Fantasy VIII. The phrase is an anagram of the phrases Succession of Witches and Love, which are the two main themes of the game, and not an actual phrase in Latin like the rest of the lyrics. The name of the song also translates to Fateful Children, which is very appropriate for the characters' childhoods. Naughty Magazine The world of FF8 has a naughty magazine called The Girl Next Door, and it happens to be a favorite of the NPC Zone. When you are on the White Seed ship, Zone laments having sold his copy, and if the player has this magazine in their inventory, Zone will ask Squall if he could give it to him. If given for free, the player receives a rename card as well as the Shiva card for Triple Triad. Alternatively, however, the player can sell it to him for 25,000 gil as well. You can find it in the Timber Maniac's building reception among the stacked magazines on the floor. However, you can get it from the Chocobo world as well. Funnily enough, if you try to buy it from the shop at the top of the train station, the owner refuses to sell it to the party since they are underaged. Though the shopkeeper does suggest that the party should talk to Zone about naughty magazines. Interestingly, you can pick up a lustful lollyho in Final Fantasy IV, and the screen turns purple when the person reads that item. Obtain the lustful lollyho. Wow. 
A truly rousing read. Infinite Gill. There is a very straightforward trick in Final Fantasy VIII through which you can make an infinite number of gill. First of all, you must buy tents from one of the shops and use the Tonberry's Recovery Medicine Refine ability to refine them into mega potions. 100 tents cost you 100,000 gill and they refine to 25 mega potions which can then be sold for 125,000 gill. This gives you a profit for every one you sell, allowing you to continue to repeat this process. Additionally, Tonberry has other abilities that can be learned to speed up this process. Call Shop allows you to perform this trick anywhere by giving you instant access. Familiar gives you the ability to access rare items at specific shops, which means you can buy cottages and turn them into mega potions. The last two are Haggle, which lets you buy tents and cottages at a discounted price, and Sell High, which allows you to sell the Mega Potions back to the stores at an even higher price. If you have all of these abilities ready to go, you can make a total profit of over 500,000 gil every time the process is repeated instead of the normal 25,000 gil. The Gilgamesh Card this card in FF8 is a one-of-a-kind card found in the Triple Triad game. Though the card itself has middle values for a level 8 card and only has one high value, it's a fan favorite due to the fact that it comes with a great card mod item. Using the ability card mod, you can refine this card into 10 holy wars. And this is a very helpful item because Holy War renders the party invincible to all damage for some time, which can prove very helpful for some difficult fights in the game. It is similar to Renoa's Invincible Moon Limit Break, though the difference here is that the player can precisely choose the time of generating the effect rather than relying on random usage. The card is based on the GF Gilgamesh, which the player can obtain in the game if they've already obtained Odin. Triple Triad's Return The Triple Triad card game returned in Final Fantasy XIV A Realm Reborn. It's a playable minigame that can be played in the areas with Triple Triad enabled, and it's based on the Final Fantasy VIII version with several differences. For example, the player does not lose a card upon losing a match, and card drops from NPCs are random. Additionally, there is another version of Triple Triad in the Final Fantasy Portal app on smartphones, which lets you battle against characters from the first 14 entries in the Final Fantasy series. The player gets the ability to create new cards as well, but it's not a very customizable feature. Since it's a mobile app, the Triple Triad game occasionally receives upgrades. And last but not least, in 1999, once FF8 had been released in Japan, Bandai produced a full set of collectible Triple Triad cards. These physical cards included 110 cards in total, as seen in the game, with 72 additional artwork cards and a collector's edition playing mat. FF8 in the Olympics An FF8 song, specifically Liberi Fatali, was played during a performance at the Athens 2004 Olympics. The athletes that used the soundtrack for their performance ended up winning a bronze medal. Flavored Bread and Hot Dogs In the localized version of FF8, the character of Zell is comically obsessed with eating hot dogs, which are his favorite food. However, in the original Japanese version of the game, he is actually obsessed with flavored bread rather than hot dogs, which are jam and paste-filled breads in the Japanese culture and can be found at normal convenience stores, school cafeterias, and even festivals. If you wait around for the scenes shown in the credits of the game, you will see Zell hilariously stuffing his mouth with flavored bread rather than hot dogs in the English version of the game. A Second Chance 
The characters of Fujin and Reijin were initially designed to appear in Final Fantasy VII. However, the inclusion of the characters of Turks made the developers feel that the presence of Fujin and Reijin was unnecessary. Eventually, they were finally given life in FF8 since the story had room for them to exist. Since then, they have appeared as cameos and playable characters in spin-off games, which includes icons for the memory card in Pocket Station as well. Crisis Level This is a hidden mechanic in FF8 that determines how often a character's limit break will appear, as well as their damage outputs and additional statuses. The Crisis Level is invisible to the player, but it's actively used in the game's coding to determine limit break outcomes. Crisis level increases when a character's HP is in critical status, which means that their current HP should be below 25% of their max. However, Cypher is an exception to this, as he only requires less than 84% of his max HP. There are four levels of crisis level, and aside from HP, Various other statuses factor in determining it as well. Interestingly, it has no effect on the chance of summoning Odin. Mini Mog Mini Mog is the name of a pseudo GF that the player can acquire. It's unique in the sense that you can use it to heal GFs in battle, and it's the only one that can do this as well. Originally, you could only acquire it using a specific amulet obtained through the Japanese exclusive Chocobo World minigame, but fortunately the remaster lets you acquire Minimog through Angelo's search. Triple Triad Origin The creators of Triple Triad drew inspiration from Japanese culture and sought to create a game that could keep players occupied during cutscenes. As trading card games were popular at the time, they deemed it a fitting concept. The in-game story behind the creation of Triple Triad is that it was invented by a psychic named Orlin, which modified tarot cards to create the game. This tale is accompanied by an image of Orlin playing the game, who is revealed to be the character Oren Durai from the game Final Fantasy Tactics. Adea's Magic Speech Adea makes a speech during a parade in the game in which she attacks a man with magic and either knocks him unconscious or destroys him. And as she does this, the crowd cheers loudly watching this happen. Though when the camera is zoomed out, it's easy to assume that the crowd is finally silent and appalled at the action. However, the audio comes back once the character falls down and they are all still laughing. Fans eventually realized that Adea had in fact used her magic to subdue the crowd into having normal reactions to her murderous actions, which is why they never stopped cheering. Cypher's Inspiration Cypher was heavily influenced by a movie in which a valiant knight defends his sorceress from evil. He liked the movie so much that he ended up copying the victory pose of this knight and it made him want to become a sorceress's knight himself. What we didn't know is that the star of the movie was none other than Laguna himself, who is the father of Squall. The Changed Demo Music During the demo that was bundled with the brave fencer Musashi, the track Raid on Dalit plays at one point. However, this was replaced by The Landing and was not included in the official soundtrack either. It is present in the final version, but never used and can only be heard in the debug room. Though no official reason was given behind this, fans have theorized that over time this is due to legal reasons as the song Hummel Gets the Rockets sounds heavily similar to Raid on Dalit which was composed by Hans Zimmer for the movie The Rock, released in 1996. Other music that is different includes variations of Don't Be Afraid, The winner,
The Loser. And Never Look Back. A specific version of Prelude also plays in the PlayStation demo, which is not included in the final game. And last but not least, copies of Parasite Eve came with a bonus disc that included a trailer of FF8 with some demo footage, which featured a different battle UI and an unused track called Visions of Dalit. This theme was later used in trailers for Final Fantasy X with copies of Final Fantasy The Spirits Within. Cut and Dummied Content There are two unused enemies in the game that can be fought in the debug room or through other cheats. One of them is Dummy, who is a test enemy that has an HP of 410. His chest has a katakana text, Dummy, mirrored, and his back also says, I'm sorry. The other enemy is simply a gun blade, which appears in place of Jero Jero after defeating the fake president in the battle scene test number 2380. Technically, this enemy does show in the game in all battles against Cypher. He uses a player model, so his weapon is a separate model, but it cannot be targeted. Thus, you don't see it as a separate threat. There are tons of hidden text and drawings in the game, and these include things like smiley cloud face, a cow, a star, a man in an ancient Egyptian pose, a dinosaur, and some pieces of text like, quote, my spirit dried up. We have unused images as well, which show random drawings, text, and a grid of hex numbers. Then we have unused areas, which include some debug stuff, a bizarre scene in the training center, which crashes the game if you press most of the buttons on the gamepad, a rocky outcrop that is included in the demo for a battle, but not in the final game, and some alternate angles to certain rooms, such as Esthar's presidential palace. The Tired Translator In the Italian PAL version of FF8, you can find a dummy enemy inside the debug room just like the other versions of the game, however, this time he comes with a scan message that is a note from the translator himself. It reads, quote, This translation is killing me. It's almost 2 in the morning. I am sleepy. I'm sleepy. Altamisha was a man. The game's villain, Altamisha, was originally planned to be a man. In the final version of the game, Altamisha is a powerful sorceress who is the main antagonist of the story. However, in early versions of the game's development, Altamisha was a male character. It is not clear why the decision was made to change Altamisha's gender, but it was speculated that it may have been done to make the character more unique or give the game a more balanced cast of characters. Altamisha's character design was also changed accordingly, and her appearance as a woman with long hair, a flowing dress, and a powerful presence was well received by the fans. Her role in the game is also very important and detailed, as she is the main antagonist of the game and the final boss, and her motives and goals are revealed throughout the game's story. FF7 Leftovers while Chrono Trigger was being finalized, the story and characters for Final Fantasy VII were being plotted out. Initially, the plan was to include a witch named Adea within the story of FF7, but before Chrono Trigger was even shipped, they deemed the witch's presence as unnecessary, and it even felt a bit too bloated. As a result, they shelved the Wicked Witch until the following entry within the series. Fujin and Reijin were also initially planned on being included within FF7, but as we stated, their appearance was too similar to the Turks. My Date with a Vampire 2 A Chinese TV series called My Date with a Vampire 2 uses the Liberi Fatali song a few times throughout its episodes. 
there is no connection between the show and FF8, and it's truly a bizarre thing to hear the FF8 soundtrack randomly play in a dramatic show about vampires from China, but it does show the popularity that the game had back in these days. Linoa The French version of FF8 has a misspelling of Renoa as Linoa, which loosely translates to late. Somehow, the developers decided to allow this, and let the translation become the official name in certain regions, which can even be seen in how certain websites call Renoa's action figure Linoa and Leona, and many YouTube videos also use that name, as that's what they know her as. The Mystery of Obel Lake If you go to a specific part of the game's map, you will find the Obel Lake. Once there, you will get the option to throw a rock into the water and to hum something. If you keep humming, you'll finally begin talking to a black shadow that asks you to find his friend Mr. Monkey. There will be a lot of traveling for this quest, so it's a good idea to do it after you have the Ragnarok. Once you follow through a bunch of tasks, you can finally end up with some rewards. These rewards include a 3 stars and a Luck J scroll item, which are nothing special, so it's up to you whether you want to experience this quest specifically. The UFO and Poo Poo There is a side quest of FF8 that leads you to a UFO, which is flown by an adorable little alien called Poo Poo. This alien can be encountered in four different areas, which are Mandy Beach, Heath Peninsula, Windhill Bluffs, and Kashkabal Desert. You only get a brief glimpse of the UFO every time, but once you complete these four encounters, you can then attack it in the forest. Once you destroy the UFO, you can find Poo Poo himself near the Balam Garden location, and you can choose to kill the creature or help him. Based on your choice, your reward will either be a Poo Poo card or an accelerator. Diminishing Sorceress Ultimisha is said to be the most powerful sorceress of all time, especially since we know that she got her power through many generations of sorceresses. Normally, this should mean that she is powerful beyond the point of destroying or defeating in any way. However, there is a hinted concept that the power of a sorceress diminishes every time it is transferred into another. Thus, if the power is weakened as it is passed on, as assumed, it makes sense as to why Ultimisha is eventually defeatable. Cypher's Second Limit Break Cypher has a secondary limit break in the game, which he uses in the boss encounter at Galbadia Garden. It's called Demon Slice. It inflicts non-elemental physical damage to one target, and to no surprise, Cypher is programmed to use this attack on Squall the most out of every other party member. Furthermore, Demon Slice is also available as a level 10 Gunbreaker skill in Final Fantasy XIV. Adele's Creepy Messages When Squall's party is going to the TV Timber Station, there is a large screen outdoors at the top of the stairs that players have passed by numerous times. There are several messages inside the screen that look like random spam characters, but upon closer inspection, you can notice creepy messages that actually have a meaning. In fact, they are repeating the same key sentences over and over. These messages read, Bring me back there. I will never let you forget about me. I am alive here. These chilling messages are sent by the antagonist Adele, which confirms that she is alive and trying to find her way back to the world. This is phenomenal attention to detail, as canonically, most technology in the world is rendered useless after Laguna and his crew send Adele to orbit the moon. It truly adds more to the immersion behind the game's story, and even leaves room for a sequel story here where Adele might finally come back for her revenge, which she is aggressively waiting for. The Demo Artifact and Other Beta Changes In the original PlayStation 1 demo of Final Fantasy VIII, you begin just before the first mission with Zell and Cypher as normal. You're given a brief rundown of the story thus far, which says, 
the Dalit dukedom at war with the Galbadia army have requested Garden to dispatch Seed, the world-renowned special team Seed from Garden. The high-speed vessels in which they ride are about to land in Dalit dukedom. Then the epic cinematic plays, which went on to entrance generations. And in the FMV, there are several minor differences compared to the full game. When the vessel finally crashes on the land, it is revealed that your third party member is Renoa instead of Selfie, and Quistus is not present either. This is of course changed in the final game. Once you get past this point, the game is mostly the same and just has minor differences, such as how the situations and dialogues play out, since the characters are different. Renoa doesn't seem to have any dialogue, which makes a lot of sense since she is replaced later. This is most likely just a simple replacement for demo purposes, rather than a larger change in the plot over time. Eventually, everything that had Renoa was later changed in the final game for this sequence, and in the escape cinematic, there is a random soldier who is helping Squall escape instead of Quistus in the demo. Funnily, there is an artifact of the demo accidentally still left in the final game. As you can see, just a few frames of Renoa in the ship, even though she is not supposed to be present there. This is most likely just a minor oversight of a mistake when making the final touches to the FMV. Other notable differences include things like the characters wearing normal clothes instead of the seed cadet uniforms. The facial structures of the characters are slightly different too compared to the last game. And X Atmo 92 is also called X Atmo 82, and some of its attacks have different names as well. The demo is more difficult to the menu being disabled, which prevents players from customizing the party and characters cannot level up either. This is also true of the PC version of the demo. The junction magic that is available is limited, so it's harder than the final game, especially if the player encounters a T-Rexar. Fortunately, however, the party has Leviathan, which is a guardian force not originally available at that point. Viewer Challenge a viewer emailed me a while back about a question that they had been pondering for over two decades. He posed the question and asked if I knew the answer, or if our audience could potentially shine some light on it. His email reads, In the Dalit mission, you fight the X Atmo 92. You're supposed to run away to the beach where Aquistus destroys it. Later in the game, you can return to the beachhead where you'll find the X Atmo 92 remains as well as some NPCs who have programmed dialogue about it. However, it's known by some that you can actually defeat X Atmo 92 before reaching the beach, and skip the Quistus cutscene entirely. So my question is, if you defeat the X Atmo 92 and return to the beach later in the game, what will you find there? Did the programmers make an alternative environment that nobody has discovered yet, or is it just exactly the same? It's likely that the programmers did not create an alternate environment for this specific scenario, but I'll leave this one to you committed FF8 fans out there. What happens if you defeat this challenging boss that was never meant to be defeated, and return to the area where its metallic corpse should have been laid to rest? Let us know in the comments below. And that's it for this video, like and subscribe to see more videos like this, and let us know what topics we should be covering next. A big shout out and thank you to the channel members that support every month, and thank you for watching. Maker out.